Chapter 6 The Changing of the Guard While King Edward and the secret elite were busy abroad building strategic alliances, it had been Arthur Balfour's misfortune to take over as Prime Minister in the wake of unpopular South African war. His administration remained true to secret elite foreign policy, but was split on tariff reform and various domestic issues. The conservatives suffered regular by-election defeats to a very vocal and confident liberal opposition, waiting impatiently for office. British democracy, with regular elections and changes of government, was portrayed as a reliable safety net against despotic rule. It has never been this. Although in 1884, a Reform Act increased male voting rights to include adult householders and men who rented unfurnished lodgings to the value of £10 a year, an estimated 40% still did not have the right to vote as a result of their status within society. Women did not have the right to vote at all, while some men could vote twice, both at their place of business or university and at their home address. <coughs> The ruling class held every advantage and their contempt for the poor was undisguised. As liberal MP Francis Nielsen observed, at the end of 1905, it would have been difficult for Dionysus to find a country, Diogenes, Diogenes to find a country under the sun where there was so deep a contempt for the poor and the meek held by the ruling class, laborers in agriculture, laborers in agriculture at any wage from 12 to 16 shillings a week, miners living in hovels. Apart from a small number of socialists funded by the trade unions, members of parliament were restricted to the well-to-do by the expense of office and by the fact that they were unpaid a state of affairs that remained in place until 1911. A prohibitive, dis a prohibitive dis deposit of 150 pounds was required for any parliamentary candidate, a sum greater than the total annual income of most British families. Indeed, it equated to twice the annual wage of the policeman. Both the conservative and liberal, liberal parties had been controlled since 1866 by the same small clique that consisted of no more than half a dozen chief families. Their relatives and allies reinforced by an occasional incomer with the proper credentials. These incomers were generally recruited from society's select educational system, most prominently from Balliol or New, Cal New College, Oxford or Trinity College Cam or Cambridge. If he proved valuable to the inner clique, the talented newcomer generally ended up married into one of the dominant families. The secret elite made an art form out of identifying potential talent, putting promising young men into positions that would serve their future ambitions and slowly wrapping them in the warmth of, it, of establishment approval and ultimate personal success. Faced with the demise, of the conservative government in 1905, the secret elite had already selected their natural successors in the Liberal Party, reliable and trusted men immersed in their imperial values. Herbert Asquith, Herbert Henry Asquith, Richard Burden Haldane, and Sir Edward Grey were Milner's chosen men and objects of his special attention. He wrote regularly from South Africa met with them in secret, went on leave in 1901, and actively instructed them on his policies. Though they were groomed as a team, Haldane was his most frequent correspondent and, like many others, very much old under his spell. He wrote to Milner during the Boer War, Just tell me how you wish us to act, and I will set about seeing what can be done. I have every confidence in your judgment. There was never any doubt about who was in charge. Their remit was to ensure that the liberals maintained a seamless foreign policy that served the grand plan, war with Germany. These three had more in common and mixed more readily with their conservative opponents than with most of their own parliamentary colleagues. 
Their Secret League connections were impeccable. Together with their good friend Arthur Balfour, they shared similar university backgrounds and were intimately involved with the inner circles of the Secret Elite. They were also members of an exclusive dining clubs at exclusive dining clubs at Grillions and the club, which played a very significant role in developing the network that promoted British supremacy. Herbert Asquith went to Balliol College, Oxford, and was a protege of Lord Rosebery under his under whose influence and patronage he blossomed. Elected to Parliament in 1886, he served as Home Secretary under Gladstone and later Rosebery from 1892 until the Liberals lost power in 1895. Asquith's personal life provides a perfect example of how the secret elite intermarried associated with one another. Asquith's personal life provides a perfect example of how the secret elite intermarried associated with one another and maintained their dominance over British foreign policy. If the first generation with whom Rhodes was directed as directly associated belonged to the 19th century, dominated by Lords Salisbury and Rosebery, the next generation that assumed power in the early 20th century included many names already identified in this book as agents or members of the secret elite. Asquith attended Balliol, with Alfred Milner, and they were in constant contact for many years. They ate their meals together at the scholarship table virtually every day for four years, and as young lawyers had Sunday dinner together throughout the 1880s. Asquith's first wife died of typhoid fever in 1891, leaving him with five young children. In 1894, he married Margaret Tannett, Margaret Margot Tennant, the free-spirited daughter of Sir Charles Tennant, director of the Nobel Dynamite Trust Company, which in 1909 boasted the largest explosives manufacturing site in the world at Ardeer on the west coast of Scotland. Arthur Balfour was one of his closest friends and the best man at his marriage to Margot at his marriage to Margot. Even when they were leaders of supposedly diametrically opposed parties, Balfour regularly dined with the Asquiths. He frequently joked that he had champagne dinners at Asquiths before going on to the House of Commons to verbally attack, to attack his host. Ludicrous as this was, it served to highlight the hypocrisy of their public altercations in Parliament where in matters relating to secret elite policy, they supped from the same they souped from the same bowl. Margot Tennant claimed in her autobiography to have written to Balfour from Egypt, where she had a brief affair with Alfred Milner before marrying Asquith, requesting that Milner be posted back to Britain and promoted to the board of the Inland Revenue. She belonged she belonged to the country house set known sarcastically as the souls, essentially upper-class socialites, many of whom were directly associated with the secret elite, including George Corzon, St. John Broderick, Alfred Littleton, and Asquith, and consequently she shared a number of friends with Milner. They were notorious for flitting about from one great country house to another or one spectacular social event to another at the townhouse of one of their elders. Asquith, Haldane, and Gray were close to Milner politically, intellectually and socially, and even when the conservatives were out of government, were out of government from 1905 to effectively 1915, Milner continued to orchestrate foreign affairs foreign office decisions. It mattered not who was in power. The secret elite interacted just as if they were in office. Edward Gray, also a Balliol man, had served as undersecretary in 1892 when Rosebery was at the foreign office. Gray's late father had been a royal equerry 
and regularly traveled abroad with Edward when he was a Prince of Wales. When he was Prince of Wales. This meant that Grey, who was King Edward's godson, had, through his father, strong ties to the royal family. Asquith and Grey were trusted men and close to the king. They had colluded with Lord Rosebery as far back as 1890 in a long-term proposal to take over the Liberal Party leadership on behalf of what was termed the Liberal Imperialist Group. Their induction into the orbit of the secret elite came through the classic route of patronage and proven association. They were loyal men, loyal to Rosebery and to the monarchy, loyal to the empire. Richard Haldane's rise to political office followed a different route and provides a fascinating insight into how the secret elite groomed able politicians for future use. R.B. Haldane came from the minor Scottish landed gentry of Clone, near Glen Eagles. He gained a first-class honors degree at Edingsburg's University, having spent a period of, having spent a period, in Gottingen, Gottingen, studying German philosophy, and learning to speak fluent German. His language skills was to prove an essential asset in a career that began unobtrusively when he was called to bar was called to the bar in London in eighteen seventy nine. There he met and was befriended by another talented lawyer, Herbert Asquith, and doors opened in front of him that might have otherwise maintained closed. How Dane stood for Parliament as a liberal in East Lothian and was duly elected. Talented, intellectual, and affable, he became close friends with two rising young stars in Roseberry's government, Asquith and the more reserved Edward Gray. This was to become the triumvirate, the triumvirate, triumvirate was ultimately enabled, which ultimately enabled the secret elites drive to war with Germany. As a backbencher, Haldane proved a poor orator. He was not included in Gladstone's government, though both Gladstone and Athquith were. And around this time, his circle of political friends and acquaintances expanded to include the purveyors of secret elite power in the Conservative Party. Arthur Balfour, Lord Curzon, George Wyndham, and Alfred Littleton. The secret elite drew him closer and closer into their confidence, and he was eventually introduced to the Prince of Wales in 1894. The two men developed a bond of trust and loyalty that strengthened in the first decade of the 20th century when they regularly dined together. He was ever the king's loyal servant. Haldane's long-term friendship with the Rothschild family was a mark, too, of their trust and confidence in him as one of them. He considered himself very intimate with the Lord and Lord Roth, Lady Rothschild and had a room at Tring reserved permanently for his weekend sojourns. The close bond between Haldane and the extended house of Rothschilds was marked by, this frequent, by his frequent visits to the Paris branch of the family to spend time with Lady Rothschild's sisters and enjoy their sumptuous hospitality. In the last years of the 19th century, the Liberal Party had almost rent itself asunder in the civil war between the aggressive imperialists led by Asquith, Gray and Haldane, and the anti-war liberals, who always remained in the majority at grassroots level. The leadership was undermined and resigned in protest, claiming that the party was being infected by dangerous doctrines and foreign policy. It was, but no one realized how deep or how dangerous the infection would prove. Despite Haldane's repeated efforts to encourage Lord Rosebery to return to the front lines of politics, the Liberal Party elected Henry Campbell Bannerman as their anti-war leader. Haldane's opposition to him never wavered. When Campbell Bannerman placed the blame for the Boer War squarely on the shoulders of Joseph Chamberlain and Alfred Milner, he could not fathom the support that Milner was always guaranteed from Asquith, Gray, and Haldane. 
put it down to a preserved Balliol solidarity. His bitter observation was that any criticism or doubt of Milner's po policies was the unpardonable sin, and that the arch offender in the Boer War scenario was Milner. But we can't get at him. The secret elite always threw a protective arm around its own, no matter the party in power. Campbell Bannerman was right. Milner was untouchable. Why then did Richard Haldane, disillusioned as he was by Campbell Bannerman and the Liberal Party, and a man whose political sympathies appeared to lie with the conservatives, not cross the floor of the House of Commons and join them? The answer lay in the fact that the secret elite's greater purpose was served by his remaining a liberal. Haldane's roots had taken inside the secret elite's council, and he was judged to be a highly valuable out asset. Alfred Milner considered him for the high commissioner's post in South Africa, but he was placed instead on a government committee on armaments. armaments. Public concern about the state of the British Army was widely voiced in the press, and by 1902, it was accepted that defects in military organization had to be tackled. Observers were surprised that the most serious contributions were coming from Haldane, a member of the anti-war Liberal Party. Placing Haldane in the war office before the Liberals came to power was a very shrewd move by the secret elite. He was able to familiarize himself with the workings of the ministry and build positive relationships with senior British military personnel who regard, regarded him highly. The king made Haldane a privy councillor in August of 1902, an exceptional move because he was a backbench MP who had never held office, but he, like Lord Escher, was the king's man. In January of 1905, almost one calendar year before the Liberal Party entered government, King Edward invited Haldane to stay at Windsor's castle to discuss future plans for foreign policy and army reconstruction. The King and the opposition backbencher, how strange. Haldane's relationship with Alfred Milner, Lord Escher, and King Edward was exceptionally close. The secret elite's other key political agent, Balfour, Lansdowne, Asquith, and Gray, shared the innermost secrets of their respective parties with one another and the king. There was always collusion on matters of foreign policy and the grand plan. This was where their allegiance lay, not to their specific party. Their duty was to the king, the empire, to Milner's dream, to Rhodes' legacy. They confronted the same problems, analyzed the same alternatives, and agreed the same solution. Germany had to go. Long before he announced it to his own party, Balfour gave Gray, Asquith, and Haldane advance warnings that he intended to resign as prime minister, giving them additional time to organize their political strategy. The immediate problem with this handover of power was Sir Henry Campbell Bannerman, the man who would become the next prime minister had no knowledge of the secret elite. He was a radical. He was anti-war. He was a genial, he was a genial, he was a genial Draper's son from Glasgow. He was not one of them, but Campbell Bannerman, who was committed to political change, had the overwhelming support of his party. Though he was certain to lead the liberals into government, the secret elite conspired with their trusted men to undermine Campbell Bannerman's influence and power from the within. From within. The three conspirators, Asquith, Gray, and Haldane, engaged in a plot worthy of ancient Rome. They met in September of 1905 at Gray's private fishing lodge at Relugus, a remote village in the north of Scotland. Determined to be rid of Campbell Bannerman, his acerbic opposition to Lord Milner had been very offensive to them, and indeed to Milner, who was by then the acknowledged leader of the secret elite. They resolved to demand that, unless he agreed to go to the House of Lords and leave the leadership of the Commons to Asquith, none of them would serve in his cabinet. 
in his cabinet. Haldane, who was always the driving force within the tight-knit group, wrote immediately to the king's private secretary, warning that he, warning that unless he, Gray and Asquith, were in a position to shape policy inside the liberal cabinet, continuity of the grand plan would be impossible. And three weeks later, he was summoned to a meeting of the inner core of the secret elites at, Bal at Balmoral. Present with the king were A.J. Balfour, prime minister and leader of the conservatives, Lord Lansdowne, the foreign secretary, and the ubiquitous Escher. Thereafter, Haldane wrote triumphantly to Asquith that the Relugus plot was thoroughly approved in all its details and that we have secured very cordial and powerful assistance. An awesome conspiracy to thwart the Liberal Party's plan for peace and retrenchment was endorsed by the secret elite. They rubber stamped a coup to undermine the democratic, the democratic process, neuter the first man of the Liberal Party, and take control of the new government's foreign policy. Incredible though it might appear, the two most senior conservative leaders were actively conspiring with the king and the unelected lord to decide the composition of the liberal cabinet. What would liberal party members have thought had they known that three of their most senior representatives were plotting in secret against their stated interests? How would they have felt had they known that the leader of the conservative party, their political adversary, was ultimately involved. The Prime Minister in waiting, Camp O'Bannerman, had no notion that his loyal colleagues had loyalties that lay elsewhere. The Relugas Three had sworn that they were that they would not serve under Camp O'Bannerman's leadership, but the King stressed how important it was that they, the Secret Elite's chosen men, should be inside the Liberal Cabinet. Guided by Lord Escher, he personally asked Haldane to take the war office. King Edward then tried to persuade Campbell Bannerman to go to the House of Lords, leaving control of the Commons to Asquith, Gray, and Haldane. Campbell Bannerman almost gave way to the pressure, but was dissuaded by his wife, whose determination propped her wavering husband and temporarily thwarted the ambitions triumvirate. triumvirate. In an eventual compromise, they agreed to support Campbell Bannerman, provided Asquith was made Chancellor of the Escher. Gray got the Foreign Office and Haldane the War Office. Continuity would be guaranteed. Control of the foreign policy would remain in trusted hands, and a complete root and branch reorganization of the War Office could begin under the watchful eye of the secret elite. Furthermore, by placing Gray and Haldane in these key posts, the Secret Relief kept firm control of their political leadership of the Committee of Imperial Defense, and so ensured that only their men in the cabinet fully appreciated the depth of preparation for eventual war with Germany. And the beauty of it was that they were shielded from view by a radical liberal, par liberal party intent on major social reform content to let Edward Gray get on with his job in the Foreign Office, whatever that might be. How the secret elite must have laughed in their, ch in their campaign, must have laughed in their champagne at the notion, how they must have laughed in their campaign at the notion of parliamentary democracy. The entire maneuver was agreed months before Arthur Balfour had even announced to his other colleagues that he was resigning. He did so in December of 1905, and the king immediately invited Campbell Bannerman to introduce his liberal government. Hey, presto, Gray, Asquith, and Haldane were appointed to these three senior cabinet posts, exactly as planned. The secret elite had all the king's men in place. The Liberal Party had been invited to form a government in December of 1905 without facing the electorate, but a general election was called in New York. Members went to back members went back to their constituencies to campaign. 
but the Relugas, but the Relugas three did not sit on their hands waiting for the results, invigorated by the threats that stemmed from the confrontation with Germany over Morocco. They hit the ground running. In the throes of the general election and before that matter had been discussed with the Prime Minister, let alone the Cabinet, Gray and Haldane gave permission for joint Anglo-French naval and military planning for war against Germany to continue. During the previous government, the Committee of Imperial Defense, itself an organ of the secret elite, had established a permanent subcommittee to prepare schemes for combined naval and military operations. Under the auspice of its top secret committee, Lord Lansdowne had approved military com conversations with France for possible immediate war against Germany. The French ambassador, Cambon, was deeply concerned that the liberal government, which stood on an anti-war platform, may not maintain Lansdowne's commitment because Sir Edward Grey had not acknowledged it. There was a sense of panic at the Quai d'Orsay, but Britain continued her support and stayed true to all that had been promised to the Classe. Would Britain continue her support and stay true to all that she had promised to the Classe? Advised, by, advised of this by the Times war correspondent, Charles Reppington, Gray asked him to reassure the French that I have not receded from anything Lord Lansdowne has said and have no hesitation in confirming it. Armed with reassurance, Reppington dined with General Gerson, Director of Military Operations and members of the Committee of Imperial Defense who stated that Britain could put two divisions into Namor and Belgium within 13 days. Who was this journalist, Reppington? Why was a war correspondent for the Times actively involved in the deepest secrets of British foreign policy? Eaton's old boy, Eaton's old boy and ex-army officer Reppington had been dismissed for dishonorable conduct with a brother's officer's wife. He was later employed at the Times by George E. Buckle, a close associate of Milner, and the secret elite. Professor Quigley demonstrated that the Times was their published voice and had been controlled by them since the 1890s. What now became evident was the Times, was that the Times, through its war correspondent, was directly involved in the secret machinations, machinations of the foreign, po foreign office. How could a journalist know more about top-secret British commitments to France than the incoming Prime Minister? With the final results of the general election still unannounced, General Grierson wrote to Brussels advising the Belgian Chief of Staff that the British government was prepared to put four cavalry brigades, two army corps, and a division of mounted infantry into Belgium with the explicit intention of stopping a German advance. Plans to move British troops into Belgium? What exactly was going on? From 1905 onwards, Britain's military link with Belgium was one of the most tightly guarded secrets, even with privileged circles. General Grierson, who was director of military operations and a member of the Committee of Imperial Defense, was present with Lord Roberts Admiral Fisher, Prime Minister Alfred Balfour, Arthur Balfour, and the Director of Naval Intelligence, Captain Charles Otley, at the CID meeting on the 26th of July, 1905. They agreed to treat the special subcommittee that would take forward joint planning with French and Belgian military personnel as so secret that minutes would not be printed or circulated without special permission from the Prime Minister. They discussed the legal status of Belgium's neutrality. A secret memorandum from the 1st of August 1905 included Gladstone's opinion that the, that the 1839 Treaty of London, which recognized the neutrality and independence of Belgium, was not binding but added that British interests were, now more than ever, opposed to the violation of Belgium neutrality. neutrality. 
The crucial point that the Treaty of London was not binding would be conveniently dropped in August of 1914. Gearson was tasked to drive forward the links with France and Belgium. On the 16th of January 1906, he opened military, official military conversations with Major Victor Hugo in France, and on the same day wrote to Lieutenant Colonel Bernardiston, the British military attache in Brussels, advising him that the British force of 105,000 would be sent to Belgium if a war broke out between France and Germany. Documents found in Belgian secret archives by the Germans after they had occupied Brussels disclosed that the chief of the Belgian general staff, Major General Ducame, held a series of meetings with the British military attach, attache over the actions to be taken by the British, French, and Belgian armies against Germany in the event of war. A fully elaborated plan detailed the landings and transpositions and transportations of the British forces, which were actually called Allied Armies, and in a series of meetings they discussed the allocations of Belgian officers and interpreters to the British Army and crucial details on the care and accommodations of the wounded of the Allied armies. Grierson was kept fully informed and approved the joint, the joint agreements, but the documents showed the, that confidentiality was stressed repeatedly, repeatedly, and above all the, necess, the necessity of keeping the conversation secret from the press was explicitly spelled out. Some observers have claimed that the Belgian government went no further than these preliminary talks because they were afraid that they might offend Germany and France. But this flies in the face of other secret diplomatic revelations. Historically, Anglo-Belgian ties ran deep. Queen Victoria was a favorite cousin of the Leopold King II, cousins of Leopold II, King of the Belgians and Edward VII understood best how to close the deal between Britain and Belgium through, the, through him. The British government later cemented the relationship by allowing, Belgium, by allowing Belgium to annex that area of Africa called the Congo Free State. The quid pro quo was a secret agreement that was in everything but name of a, was in everything but name and alliance King Leopold II sold Belgium's neutrality for African rubber and minerals, and Britain acknowledged the annexation of the Congo in return for military cooperation that continued in absolute secrecy from that point forward. Thus, Belgium bargained away her status as a perpetually neutral country by entering into a military compact with Britain. The huge significance of this may not be immediately apparent, but will become so when Sir Edward Gray's fateful speech on the seventh, on the third of October, the third of August, nineteen fourteen, is thoroughly analyzed. In those dark January days, with the Moroccan crisis still unresolved, the secret elite intrigue drew Sir Edward Gray from his election meetings in Norfolk back in London, for an urgent for an urgent briefing from Lord Escher and Sir George Clark a former governor of Victoria who had become the first secretary of the Committee of Imperial Defense. Gray was well pleased to learn that the armed forces had begun to coordinate planning for joint operations against Germany. He wrote to Haldane on the 8th of January to advise him that war could be imminent and that he had been reassured by Admiral Fisher that the Navy was so ready that it could drive the German fleet off the sea and into shelter at any time. The int the inference was that Haldane, as Minister of War, should be equally prepared. They met at Berwick on the 12th of January, where a momentous decision was taken. Haldane told Gray to inform the French that military communications should proceed directly and officially between General Gerson and the French military attaché. 
They thus gave permission for a senior military director to coordinate planning with his French counterpart for war without the knowledge or approval of the prime minister, the cabinet parliament, or the British people. From whom did their authority, from whom did their authority stem? No two men would dare commit Britain to such action unless they had the assured backing of an immensely powerful force, and they did. Haldane knew that Escher and the Committee of Imperial Defense approved of these moves. The king would certainly have been informed by Lord Escher, and this was clearly diff driven by the secret elite. At the same time as these ongoing machinations, the Liberal Party was vigorously campaigning across the country on a promise of peace, retrenchment, and reform. Campbell Bannerman began the campaign with the rousing rally at the Albert Hall. In the Albert Hall, where he denounced war and promised that the liberal foreign policies would be opposed to aggression and to adventure, animated by a desire to be the best, to be on the best terms with all nationalities, and to cooperate with them in the common work of civilization, he added. We are fighting against these powers, privileges, injustices, and monopolies which are unalterably opposed to the triumph of democratic principles. These, pr these, presents, these present words were further expanded into a vision for his government. It is vain to seek peace if you do not also ensure it. The growth of armaments is a great danger to the peace of the world. What nobler role could this great country assume than at his fitting moment to place itself at the head of the League of Peace? On such a promise, Campbell Bannerman led his party to a landslide victory in 1906. These were two irreconcilable positions. Campbell Bannerman and his government were committed to peace while Gray and Haldane had set the country on a course for war. President Precedent dictated that agreement should be sought from the Prime Minister and the Cabinet, but this never happened. How did they manage to pull off one of the most devious deceptions in parliamentary history? No official record survives to confirm what precisely happened, and the conspirators themselves sowed the seeds of confusion. Haldane claimed in his notoriously and unreliable autobiography, that he dramatically abandoned his election campaign over the weekend of 13th and 14th of January to travel to London to advise Campbell Bannerman of what had been agreed with the French and to seek his approval. According to Haldane, he at once saw the point and he gave me authority for directing the staff. According to Haldane, according to Haldane, he at once saw the point, and he gave me authority to direct the staff at the War Office to take the necessary steps. Charles Reppington confirmed that Haldane told him that Campbell Bannerman was very firm and clear on the point that we should be prepared for all emergencies and that conversations between the two staffs were permissible. This cannot be true. Campbell Bannerman was not in London that weekend. He remained in Scotland throughout the elections and did not travel south to London until the night of the 26th. Drafts of various notes were allegedly copied to Campbell Bannerman, but there is no evidence to support assertions that they were ever cleared with him. Furthermore, Haldane later claimed, I saw Colonel Huguet, the French attache, and authorized him, Sir Neville, Littleton, and General Grierson to study together plans for joint action against Germany. If Haldane's recollection of these events, written privately in 1916, is accurate, the British Secretary of State for War personally met with the French attache and authorized plans that would have been seen, would have seen British troops rush to Belgium in 1906. But at that time, in the years that preceded the First World War, questions raised in Parliament about the British government's commitment to France were, rep were repeatedly answered with the reassurance that there, would, there were no such commitments. Gray indeed, Gray agreed with Escher 
that the Prime Minister should, for the time being, be kept in the dark about military contracts. On the 9th of January, he wrote to both Campbell Bannerman at his home in Scotland and Lord Ripon, Liberal Leader of the House of Lords, to inform them that he had promised the French diplomatic support, but no more. Several days later, the Prime Minister received a note from his trusted Liberal colleague, Lord Ripon, stating, Our engagements with France are, I understand, confined to a promise of full diplomatic support, and I have no doubt that the French government understand that we are bound to nothing beyond that. It is clear that Gray contacted both Campbell Bannerman and Lord Ripon, but was lying to them. The evidence proves that he and Haldane agreed to a joint military preparation with France, but told the Prime Minister that these were merely diplomatic com conversations. It was a deliberate deception by secret elite placemen. Arthur Ponsonby, Campbell Bannerman's principal private secretary, knew nothing about the military talks. He was astounded by later claims made by Gray and Haldane that they had kept the Prime Minister fully informed. Ponsonby was adamant that CB never apprehended the significance of conversations with France, nor did he see how we were gradually committed. Had Campbell Bannerman known that Gray and Haldane were, were up to, he would have confronted them. Given his staunch anti-war credentials, he would never have allowed Gray and Haldane to proceed. In Gray's autobiography, he deliberately dissembled on the question of why the conversation were never brought to the attention of the cabinet, making out that the prime minister was ambivalent about when it might be discussed. He admitted that he ought to have asked for a cabinet meeting, but could not remember why he failed to do so, claiming memory loss. This is unbelievable. Just a few days later, the first cabinet meeting of the new government passed without Haldane or Gray making mention of their cataclysmic decision. What seems even more incredible is that Campbell Bannerman never raised the issue himself. Why? It is patently obvious that the wool had been pulled over his eyes. Numerous documented instances will be presented in our narrative which prove that the Relugus III repeatedly, repeatedly lied to the cabinet and parliament about the existence of military agreements with France. It is a perfectly reasonable assumption that they were lying in their memoirs and suggesting that Campbell Bannerman was kept fully informed. The problem remains that there is no evidence other than that given by the conspirators themselves in cynically sterilized accounts written long after Campbell Bannerman was dead. No one was, no one was then in a position to refute their claims. And what of Asquith? Although he appeared to have played little part in this particular aspect of the conspiracy, he had been kept fully informed, according to Haldane. Asquith had never openly undermined Campbell Bannerman, who trusted him both as a political ally and a friend. But there can be no doubt about his treachery towards the aging prime minister. The Relugus Three were constantly in cahoots, and Asquith operated as a buffer between them and Campbell Bannerman keeping his focus on domestic matters. Asquith, Asquith only, Asquith's only contribution to the debate was denial. Summary for Chapter 6, The Changing of the Guard British politics was dominated by half a dozen families from the ruling elite. They tended to intermarry, but fresh blood was recruited predominantly from Balliol and New College Oxford. Faced with an imminent change of government, Asquith, Haldane, and Gray were selected in order to ensure a seamless foreign policy. Each was closely associated with members of the secret elite, and all were close to the admiral, to the admirers of Alfred Milner, with whom they were in regular contact. The three met at Relugus in September of 1905, where they conspired to usurp the Liberal Party leader, Campbell Bannerman. Haldane confirmed their conspiracy with King Edward at Balmoral in the company of Alfred Balford and Lord Lansdowne, 
their political opponents. The King stressed the importance of their taking office in the new government, even if Campbell Bannerman refused to go to the Lords. Towards the end of the Conservative government, Balfour and Lansdowne created a secret subcommittee of the Committee of Imperial Defense, which began secret military conversations with France and Belgium over the actions to be jointly taken in a war with Germany. The commitments made by Belgium and secretly continued. The commitments made by Belgium and secretly continued thereafter nullified her status of neutrality. On taking office, Haldane and Gray approved the continuation of this, these secret agreements without first getting approval from the Prime Minister. They later confirmed, they later claimed that he was informed, but there is no reliable evidence to confirm exactly what was said. They deliberately kept all knowledge of this from the Liberal Cabinet because it was a step to war with Germany.